Well, welcome, Travelers Blueprint community. I am Elliot Shibley, and here with me, as always, is the indomitable Robert Demena. Indomitable. What does that mean? Yeah, I, it's a it's one that I've heard before, but I kind of like it. It's uh, impossible to subdue or defeat. Ooh, uh, also, a synonym a synonym is unconquerable, un unassailable, That's- invincible. It's quite the compliment. It is. It <laughs> Thank is. you. You're Thank welcome. you. I don't know how true that is, though, but I, I do appreciate the compliment. So, okay, before Elliot gets to the guest of the day, I want to just run through what we have going on behind the scenes. I want to push you and encourage you to join our social media platforms. That is where we post the pictures provided to us by our guests that you can, uh, you know, enhance your, your listening experience with. You can comment on, you can ask us questions, you can ask our guest guest questions, and just interact with us on, on the content we put out. You can subscribe to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you know, we're all over the place. YouTube is a big one because we actually post video clips of our conversations there, and you can actually watch the full uh, conversation as well. Our website has been updated massively during this quarantine. If you subscribe to our newsletter, you get a free cheat sheet that breaks down individual uh, items when it comes to travel, from restaurant reviews to you know how to book airline tickets. Uh, it's it's a really good cheat sheet, a really good resource to boost your your knowledge when it comes to booking travel. We offer travel consulting services where you can sit down with me personally one-on-one via zoom and i will help you plan your trip to the minute detail uh and (laughs) you nothing will go missed you will have an incredible experience and it's something that i'm incredibly passionate about doing and i look forward to meeting all of you we are currently working on a travel book we're working on a workbook we have a new travel around table podcast series where we're breaking down the diversity of our planet with a group of people those episodes are going to be released once a month and what else do we have we have a brand new tour guide yeah. exclusive with tours exclusive to the traveler's blueprint his name is keschler he's a great guy he's a philly native check out the website book a tour with him as soon as you can and you know what if you're in philadelphia shoot us a message maybe we'll be in the area and we can grab a drink or you know walk to the 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 liberty about with you so i think that's everything and let's get into it all right so our guest today was a really fun conversation in general and i i hope that we get to do something with him in the future and he has done several trips and we'll do several more after the two that we discussed today um from hiking to the South Pole and back unassisted. It is something that no one had ever done before. And there's a little caveat to that, which you'll find out during the episode. But he also, with his buddy, kayaked from Australia to New Zealand. Right? How yep. cool is that? It, and it, it something, <laughs> something not good happened. We got a little bit more detail than we wanted. You'll see what I mean. Uh, anyway, without further introduction, please welcome Justin Jonesy. Welcome to the Traveler's Blueprint. Start designing your next adventure. Justin, welcome to the Traveler's Blueprint podcast. Elliot, thank Bob. Thanks for having me. So, do you typically go by Jonesy? Yeah, I, I think so. I'm pretty comfortable. You can call me whatever you want. I've been called a lot of things, but Jonesy's pretty good by me. All right. All right. So you are considered one of Australia's premier motivational speakers, uh, and you are also an, an extreme adventurer, to say the least. Uh, you are joining us today to discuss a few of your adventures across the world, including the first ever unsupported and unassisted ski expedition from the coast of Antarctica to the South Pole and back and the first ever kayak expedition across the Tasman Sea, unassisted and unsupported. So both of those you did with a partner. And we'll talk about the third one. But beyond that, can you give us a little bit of explanation of who you are and how you got to become this motivational speaker and extreme adventurer? I I think I kind of fell into it, really. I mean, to be completely honest, uh, by trade, by background, I am actually a scientist. So I am a physiologist. 
And for me, adventure was something was just a, there was just an interest and a passion of mine. And uh, when I was growing up in, in high school, it was the place that I sort of found myself you know, and, I, and I realized that it was where I could actually kind of express myself and be the person that I, I kind of wanted to be. And I come back to the city and, and live someone else's life. And that's why I suppose I went down the path of becoming a scientist and trying to push into medicine. And I, <sighs> I'm really kind of driven by, I suppose, a fear of missing out. And for me, adventure and the outdoors provides me with the perfect platform to go out there and experience just everything you can in life and, and push yourself in some pretty gnarly, gnarly environments. So as a result, I've done some pretty cool trips. On your website, you have a quote from Oscar Wilde, and I love it. And it is, to live is the rarest thing in the world. Most people exist, that is all. Can you explain that and why you have that on your website? I suppose that's, that's, I've got that quote up there because it's, it's a big fear of mine. I, I'm afraid that I will end up as, you know, a 75 year old bloke sitting on the porch and going, Jesus, I did not live this life. You know, I did not make the most of this time. And that's what probably drives me. It's that FOMO and that, that, that wanting to have no regrets when I'm older. Uh, to be able to look back on a life of, you know, adventure, misadventure. And, you know, I'd rather regret the choices I've made in life rather than my inability to make choices at all. And that's fundamentally the reason why I do what I do. So now, can I ask how old are you? I am, geez, I've got to work this out, 36. 36, okay. And you already have that insight as a 36-year-old that is quite impressive. So you also are married with a one-year-old or a two-year-old at this point? Oh, wow. Actually, I've got two kids now. Two kids uh, now? What? Yeah, they, they multiply. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have one kid and then let's be honest, all, all sex dries up in the household. Then the idea to have another kid comes back and you're like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. <laughs> um, so we've got two kids. Uh, one's four and the other one is five months old. Oh, wow. Oh, well, congratulations. congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So hectic time to be in isolation with kids. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Uh, so, so something I'm, I, I want to do, I want to play devil's advocate a little bit. So after your, your explanation and what Elliot and you were just talking about saying that, you know, this is, you do these trips because you want to want to live. Now, someone may look at that and say, well, you're going out of your way to put yourself in extremely dangerous situations. Um, and that's how you're justifying living. What would you say to those people who say, Hey man, if you want to live, just play it safe. Don't go to the South pole, for example, unassisted. Thanks. Thanks for being the devil's advocate, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, I, I honestly believe that, you know, you, you can just go about life and yeah, yeah, sure. You're living, you're going through all the motions, you're buying all the things, you're getting all the mod cons, you're getting the, the, the upgraded television, you know, going to this family holiday that everyone's doing and that's all well and cool. But for me, I, I really want to, that doesn't help me grow as a person. Like it's about growth. So if you want to grow as a human being, you really need to get uncomfortable. You need to get, you need to be comfortable with discomfort and you only can grow when you push the, the edges of that box, the boundaries, you find some room to grow and move. And so for me, the outdoors and these trips, when you're pushing that fine line is actually where you find the most growth and it's the most quintessentially amazing experience in, in terms of being able to, you know, push that, that growth along in such a short period of time. It's, it's phenomenal. Like I, I highly recommend some of these kind of expeditions and start small though, but you know, find your cup of tea and then chase that. And for everyone, it doesn't necessarily have to be down in Antarctica or crossing the Tasman sea or whatever. It could be, you know, adventures in business on in the dramatic arts and sport, you know, and just regular travel. So yeah, it is what it is. That's, Perfectly said. Yeah. And, and I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I was just trying to, uh, I guess, I know, get that I out. Know. Of <laughs> yeah. So can we talk about the Tasman Sea first? That sure. was a trip that you, it took you about two months to complete. But I think a lot of people focus on that, that it took you two months and, you know, that was it. Oh, they just went out one day and crossed the Tasman Sea, it took them 62 days but there were three and a half years of planning involved in that trip. So that was ended up only being like 10% of the overall experience. But right? Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, like these these kind of expeditions, these well, actually, anything in life, if you want to be truly successful at it, it's all in that preparation stage. You set yourself up for fail, failure or success, and it's in that lead up. I honestly believe it's ninety percent preparation, ten percent execution. And don't get me wrong, that ten percent is a really hard, hard, hard ten percent. So with the Tasman, um, and the Tasman Sea is the is the the, the sea between Australia and New Zealand. So we call it colloquially in Australia, the ditch. So we cross the ditch in a kayak completely unsupported. And so me and another mate Cass uh, paddled across and uh, we trained, planned, prepared for three and a half years. Didn't think it was going to take that long um, for a journey that initially we thought was only going to be 35 to 40 days and ended up turning to 62. Yeah. Whoa. So when did you know you were finally ready? And how did you know you were finally ready? That's actually a really tough question. It's a really, really tough question because we actually initially wanted to leave a a year earlier than when we actually departed. We were pushing for a certain weather window and a certain time frame. And we, we had to delay the trip an entire year to the next season. But we almost made the biggest mistake of our lives by just being so focused on this is when we have to leave that we try to... I suppose, put a lot of band-aid fixes on problems that cropped up. We actually had a, a kayak didn't work correctly in these kind of big swells and seas. And so we tried just band-aid fixing it just to try and go, no, 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 it needs to be good enough so that we can get out there by the certain time. Um, and if we went out in that kayak, it was a death trap. It was honestly, it probably would have killed us or we would have needed rescue in a very short period of time. And so for us, we actually had a bit of white line fever just to get to the start line. And we realized that you can't be guided, you know, you sure have a target aim for a certain period of time of when you want to go, but you've got to be guided by the process. You've got to be guided by the checks and balances, by doing all the tests you need to do before you you've ticked every box down a certain list go, all right, we've satisfied those requirements. Now we can go. Um, I want to stress a little point here though. The to do list before an expedition like this is never going to get short, smaller. It never is. You go on a sea trial, come back, the to-do list is long. You go back, tick all those boxes. You go back out again, another to-do list pops up again. So you've got to divide that list into two. And the list, one list is the things that are critical, the things that you have to do. If you do not do, you will die. And the other list is the things that are nice to do. They'll make your life easier, but aren't critical, aren't crucial. One list of them, obviously, you know which one it is. The critical list has to be completed. The other one is kind of a little bit more negotiable. Is there ever a fear of I've never done this and therefore subconsciously it pushes back what your actual timeline? Because there are certain things in life where I have no idea or it's the first time I'm ever doing it and I'm really nervous for it. And subconsciously I tell myself like, oh man, you don't really have to do it. Or maybe we just wait another week and then we'll do it then. Yeah. I actually think that's probably one of the positives. I'm like, by having that naivety, like of not having done something, uh, I think often you underestimate how hard a challenge can be. And so you're like, a great example is the Tasman, for example. It, it is a journey that in reality probably wasn't something that we should have done. But we were so young, stupid in terms of like, we were full of bravado. We thought we were invincible. We thought we could take this on. When we came up with the idea, we actually hadn't ever paddled a kayak offshore you know, out onto the ocean, all the paddling we've been do- been doing had been basically inland on rivers, lakes. And so it was a ludicrous idea. And looking back on it, I can go, yeah, that was pretty silly, you know, to come up with that plan having no experience. But I honestly believe that you should, you kind of, you set yourself on a dream and you should never let the lack of skill stop you from having that dream. You have that dream, you work out what that critical path is that you need to complete and all the tasks and you need to go about just achieving those things to get to that dream, get to that target you're speaking my language completely. Like <clears throat> I'm, I'm a very methodical uh, person and I'm uh, under the belief that if it, no matter what it is, no matter how big the goal is, you can always micromanage it. You always can break it down into subsections and then break those subsections into even smaller subsections. And if you tackle one minute task, one tiny task at a time, you can build up to that ultimate goal. And I think that, I think you could do that with almost anything uh, really. And as long as you have the dedication and the ambition to push you to do it. So 
Yeah, I love that. That, that. that makes complete sense to me. What doesn't make complete sense to me is the actual, the, the act of what you did. Like, so water, water petrifies me. Open water petrifies me. It, it's just the scariest thing about our planet to me. I would much rather risk my life climbing Mount Everest than going out into the open water. There's just, you know, too many unknowns. And so I want to kind of get a feel for what it was like once you, uh, you're out in open water and you're in a kayak. I mean, for anybody who's been in a kayak, you're essentially just, you're, you're right on the water. And now the boat's not very secure or safe, relatively speaking. And now you're at the mercy of the elements and the wildlife and uh, did you have any sort of, did you hit a point in the trip where you're like, oh, I don't know if this is a good idea or did you just power through and, and can you explain some of the elements that you had to deal with? There's, al- there's always going to be so much doubt. There's always going to be so much doubt when you're on a trip like this and, and, and good on you for isolating. I think the ocean is a scary place. It, it really is. You know, I've done a lot of trips kind of all over the world and different environments in the cold and the heat on the ocean. And the ocean is as beautiful as it is as it is it's the only place that feels at times malicious it feels like it's out to get you like you can be on a becalmed ocean where there is not a ripple in the water it's pure gossamer silk it just looks amazing and 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 eerie as well and then six hours later, you can be in a storm and those waves are starting to build and they're 15 feet. And they, well, the biggest waves we had on that whole trip was about 33 feet high, like 10 meters high. You don't get many of those on freshwater <laughs> rivers. Or no, no, no. So, I mean, like, it, it just feels like, it feels like it's out to get you sometimes. So it's gnarly. It is gnarly. Um, but yeah, look, doubt is always going to, doubt is always going to come into your minds. And we had a lot of horrible things kind of happen on that trip where you start to really regret your decisions at times to, to put this trip together. One in particular, we did a two week circle in the middle of the ocean. So in a straight line, if you were to do it in kilometers, it's 2,200 kilometers in a straight line. So what that that's about I'm going to say 1,600 miles. Is yeah, it? Sounds right. yeah. Yeah. Something like that. And uh, we end up paddling 3,318 kilometers. So we did an extra 50%. So you're looking at, you know, 22 to 2,400 miles in terms of like how, how far we actually paddled. Wow. Um, yeah. Two week circle in the middle of the ocean storms, big waves around us. And we were like, yeah, did we make the right decision? I don't know about this. And yeah, that's when you got to kind of trust that plan that you developed over three and a half years, trust the team that's behind you. Although we had no one around us in the ocean, we had a team that spanned about 17 different countries involved in this trip. And so when we were stuck in this circle, we came up with a bit of a plan to paddle 150 kilometers. So hundred miles backwards towards Australia to loop out of this current whirlpool and use the winds and the currents to our advantage so that we could Apollo 13 star slingshot out of it. And we spoke to our land team based in Sydney. Our land team based in Sydney spoke to the CSIRO, which is Australia's leading scientific body, who in turn engaged NASA, got real-time satellite imagery, and then analyzed it for us and sent it back to us. And that's the only reason to have Whoa. that kind of support. Yeah, insane. Wow. That's how we got out of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's incredible. Wait, how, did, how did you get NASA? to aid in this i do not have a clue like we were these just these two idiots paddling in a kayak in the middle of the ocean and our land team based in sydney was the one that mobilized this 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 we had a great team behind us and this they had uh, like all these meteorologists involved and those guys had an into you know satellite imagery from nasa and, and getting those people to provide that sort of kind of data so they could analyze it using sort of their crazy crazy imagery and machinery so it's um it's very lucky for us that we had those connections. That's, that's, that's incredible. Was there yeah. any sort of scientific discovery that came as a result of your expedition? Any, anything that we've learned? Um, oh, I wouldn't say anything kind of crazy and amazing. We've learned a lot about a circle in the middle of the ocean. There's this, this whirlpool pattern. <laughs> uh, but it, it's, it, yeah, no, I think what, what, it did do is a lot more people started paying attention to, to, I suppose, some of the current patterns in, in some of these trips and being able to get data a lot more on demand. And I think that that has changed the way people have planned certain expeditions and trips. It's, it's interesting. It, 
<clears throat> it's cool to see that there are still ways to have these sort of expeditions because as we uh, evolve and we've uh, navigate through every corner of the planet, people are getting more creative in the types of expeditions they're doing. And this is, this is one of them. The, the other one, well, there's two more that we're going to talk about, but the other one that I found incredibly interesting and one that gave me much less anxiety was your, your Arctic expedition where you actually walked from uh, the, the edge of Antarctica uh, near Australia, correct? All the way to the South pole. And oh, oh, oh. I'll correct you slightly. So it was, yeah, it was the, actually on the Chilean side. So we left from, oh. yeah, we, on the other side of the, so the, where the, the geographical landmass of Antarctica ends. So the coast of Antarctica there now that doesn't include, and this is still out there for someone to do. So if someone's listening to this podcast going, Hey, here's a trip, trip for you. Um, no one's actually ever done it with starting one foot in the water on the edge of the ice shelf. So we started where the edge of the land was and then skied from there to the South pole and then back. And that was, uh, 2,285 kilometers, which is, um, come on, let's do some, let's do some maths. That's around, I don't know, I'm going to say 1500 miles again ish. Um, wow. Yeah. And, and that, that was, that was a pretty full on trip. And again, considering a year and actually 15 months before we headed down to Antarctica, we couldn't ski just a minor box to tick off to learn how to ski. Is this like the only kayaking on rivers and lakes? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, like I'm a really average bloke. Like you look at some of these people you probably had on the show and you look at the other adventures out there and they're like six foot eight, you know, built like a, excuse me, brick shit house, if I can say that, like, you know, like, feel like a Terminator. <laughs> and then you got me and I'm a really average guy, but it's all about the process. It's about having the risk management plan. It's about <laughs> having the right mindset and just going about doing it, you know? So I'm sure a lot of people are like going, how, how, what are you guys doing out here? Like, you shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> so you're the people that are like, they're going to die. Yeah. Yeah. People are like, well, who are these guys? And then like, oh, they did it. They actually did it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, you're you're from between, as you mentioned before the podcast, Australia and Bali, not necessarily a lot of snow to prepare. So, yeah, when was, yeah where did you go to learn to ski to do this? So, yeah, I, I, as I mentioned to you guys but offline, I'm half, actually half Australian and half Chinese Indonesian. So I don't really come from an environment where you have that much snow. So, in Australia, there are a couple of ski fields, but they're not really that high. I think they're more like <laughs> hills rather than mountains. And you, we learned how to ski there initially on those, those hills. And then we went to New Zealand. But the true experience and truly how we deal with the cold and that kind of experience actually happened up in Canada. So we went up to Baffin Island, northeast corner of Canada. And it was, you know, brutal. So February in Australia, we flew out of Sydney on a weekend that was 40 degrees above. So that's 100, what, 106 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we flew across the world, landed in Canada and Baffin Island, and it was minus 42. So that was actually minus, yeah, minus 44 Fahrenheit or whatever it is. Right. (laughs) And whoa, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) just complete slap in the face and but it was the perfect place for us to learn we learned under the tutelage of some amazing polar guides there and learn how to survive in that environment um and make the mistakes there rather than down in a place like antarctica you have to do that training you have to do that preparation and okay so so moving past i guess the the preparation (laughs) and you finally land in antarctica and you decide to start putting one foot in front of the other and just and just moving through I mean, <laughs> what did you eat? Uh, like, how did you actually? Can you, yeah, I mean, what what was your day to day like? You know, how did you know how many miles to walk? I don't know. I, explain this to me. <laughs> okay, so we we, we had a, a limited amount of time down in Antarctica. So from where we were going, they set up a a, a station, a base down there called Union Glacier. And this base is open for the summer down there. And generally that's three, three and a half months. And so we had a bit of a truncated season because it was uh, really bad weather. We couldn't fly down there straight away. We had to wait in Chile for a while. And we only had 90 days 
before the supposed last plane flight of the season was going to leave that portion of Antarctica and this base was going to shut down. And so when we started the trip, we knew we had 90 days to finish this trip and we knew the distance. So roughly we had to average, you know, 25 kilometers in a day. And so that would be, you know, what's that? 18 miles a day or so. 25 k's a day, something like that. Mm-hmm. And over the course of three months. So that's, that's what we had to do. But trying to do that in a place like Antarctica is a completely different thing. So food wise, you're going to be burning through roughly, you know, 10,000 calories, nine to 10,000 calories per day per person. So to give you that in Big Mac term, that's probably around 20 Big Macs each and every day. (laughs) He knows Americans well. (laughs) (laughs) And we couldn't, we couldn't take that amount of food with us. So we only had, you know, rations that were about 6,000 calories a day. And that's a lot of dehydrated meals that you're you're adding a lot of things like olive oil to bran oil, um, coconut oil, or or even actually dehydrated butter. There's actually that stuff out there to boost up the number of calories. Um, But you've also got to think about the mechanics of how you actually eat a meal down in Antarctica because everything freezes. So when you're in your tent, relatively easy, but when you're out on the trail, we'd have this, are you familiar with the word scroggin? No nope. trail mix. Tra- trail mix. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. We'd have a trail mix where you know it's not your regular trail mix. It'd be like cheese. It'd be you know bacon. It'd be like salami. It'd be um, and then you'd mix chocolate, nuts, and all this in crushed up chips. You crush up chips and put them in there, and then it'd be like in this bag, and you get a spoon and you just like scoop it up and eat it. That sounds like awesome. That. Yeah, I it was pretty that. full on. What do you yeah, call it? Uh, scroggin. Scroggin. Yeah, is, that, no, is that is that spelled how it sounds? Yeah, yeah. S C R O G G I N. It's too similar to scrotum. Uh, really <laughs> all right, I'm out. glad someone else thought it. <laughs> um, all right, all right. So, so I have an idea of what you're eating now. Now, can I ask you this? <laughs> no scrotums. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> no. Wait. How how did you poop? I'm, oh, so I'm surprised you didn't ask that about the kayak trip. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, oh, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, both of them. That's yeah. very important. Yeah, well, the, the kayak one's pretty easy. You just turn to the side and you've got the world's biggest bidet, bidet to wash up in because it just goes straight over the side. But the, the, the hard thing about that is you can't not watch the other person, if that makes sense. I know that sounds a bit creepy, but right. you've, got, yeah. you've got to be worried about waves bringing it back into the boat. So you've got to be get ready to fend off. Oh. Um, yeah, I, I know, met, it's awkward. Have you ever watched... A dog poop. Me, yeah, I've, I've got a dog, so I, I see that happen all the time. <laughs> is that is that what it feels like? Is it like really awkward? Like you kind of make eye contact, but you yeah. know it's just terrible for both of yeah, you. Yeah, and, and, and the weirdest thing is, like, so I, I was sitting in the back seat the entire journey, and Cass was up the front, and so he uh, he'd never really see me poo that much. He'd check, turn around, and check, you know, but I'd be paddling along and I'd be seeing this guy just there, just doing a poo. And like, often he just turned and, looked at me, <laughs> and I'd be like, Oh dude, that's so creepy. It really is. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, what a yeah. bonding experience. Yeah. I know. I know. Have you ever watched a man poo for 62 days straight? <laughs> you should try it. <laughs> <laughs> no, Change yeah. your life. <laughs> and then down in Antarctica, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a mission down there. So we tried to, and luckily you generally only went to the bathroom, you know, to do a poo once a day and you try and do it when the tent's set up so that you can actually use the tent as tent as a windbreak. Um, and you had Is to that so proper- the poop doesn't freeze to your leg. Uh, well, if you're pooing on your leg, then that's that's a bigger worry you've got to worry about. I mean, like, I don't know how you do it, Elliot, but seriously, yeah, well, <laughs> you're doing it wrong. <laughs> well, I assume there's a lot of wind. Yeah, there, there is a lot of wind, but uh, but it's it's more so you got a little shelter. But the, the crazy thing is, like, you get ready, you're like, all right, I'm going to the toilet. You know, what you do is you actually have to carve some snow blocks down there because we didn't have enough toilet paper. You know, you had, you know, a couple of squares of toilet paper per day per person kind of rationed. So that's just for the, if I can say this, like that's just for the polish at the end. So it's the <laughs> snow blocks that do main, the main work, but you've got to have no glove on because you don't want to contaminate your glove. And so you pop your hand out and after about 20 seconds, you don't know what's going on back there. You can't feel your hand. And so you just got to do as good as you can. Wow. Okay. All right. There you I'm go. glad I asked. I, are, are you, you are you really are you, glad? i am i am i feel you know i've learned something today <laughs> how to poo in in on the south pole <laughs> now so so this this trip i mean 1500 miles right and so you finally you make it to the south pole one 
is there a marker there? How did you know? There is, there is actually, okay. there's, the, there's a couple of markers down there. So there's the, the geographical South pole, which is, you know, the bottom of the world. And there's the ceremonial South pole, which is where, you know, Roald Amundsen first erected his, his, um, his flag. And so when we got down there, you go down and there's actually like a barbershop pole sticking out of the ground with this round globe on it. No way. And like, yeah, it is. It's, it's insane. Like you see this thing. I mean, like, that's a bucket list <laughs> thing to see that. I mean, tell you what, uh, and you see this thing and you're like, Oh, we're like so stoked and excited. So we started running around it thinking we're like <laughs> circumnavigating the world and we're like, woohoo, you know, that's, that's faster than all you around the world sailors. Uh, cheap wow. And, and uh, I didn't know that. I didn't realize that that was the, I mean, I've seen that depicted in movies, that barbershop pole. That's oh, like, yeah. wow. It's yeah. real. Yeah. Yeah. That's real. So, so you hit that and now it's like, all right, uh, let me take a poo. And now we have to make our way back. Um, well, that- we can't actually, you can't actually poo down there, uh, down the South pole. The, the reason for that <laughs> is that, uh, all, all the poo in the sort of like last degree. So the, the 112 kilometers, which is, you know, the last 80 odd miles, 70 odd miles, you've got to collect all your poo. And then you got to take it back out with you and then you can drop it sort of outside that radius around the South pole. But, um, so we, we hit the South pole, you know, we took some photos, you did some obligatory sort of sponsor things that we had to do down there. And since we were trying to do the unsupported return journey, there's a South pole station there. We couldn't afford to go into that place cause that would potentially negate our unsupported, um, you know, portion uh, of our trip. Right, right. So we stayed there for about an hour and a half, you know, did what we had to do and then turned around and started skiing back. And that was, um, that was where the trip really got hard because we'd taken 62 days to get to the South Pole. We had some pretty horrible conditions. We had, you know, a foot and a half of snowfall in the first week. We had two weeks straight of whiteouts. It, we went really slow. And so it meant we only had 27 days to ski the return journey. And that meant we had to basically ski a marathon each and every day. Yeah. And when I was reading about this, uh, I I read that, you know, you were dealing with starvation and dehydration and even sleep depravity. Do you, can you explain some of the the actual situations you were in where you dealt with some of these? Yeah. So at day 37 of that trip, we realized we were going too slow and so we, we needed to ration. And so what we decided to do is every second day basically was going to be a half ration day. So your body's burning 10,000 calories and you're only consuming maximum 3,000 calories. Now that's not a very good situation to be in. And so the weight really started stripping off. It's like falling off us. Over the course of the whole journey, I lost 30, kilo, 30 kilos, which is 66 pounds of weight over the, that trip. And uh, <laughs> my body started to break down on that return. So I'd go to the bathroom, I'd be passing blood, you know, the, the hunger you'd feel when you just, these cramps you'd get and the hunger you feel is just something that I never want to feel again. I've never been that hungry in my life. You'd, you know, I remember eating all the toothpaste I had one night because there was just something else to eat. Um, wow. And yeah, it, it got dark. It really did. We had issues with our fingers because circulation, you know, basically our nerves had died in the lower two thirds of our fingers. We didn't get frostbite. We got frost nip. And that's where the nerves die, but the flesh doesn't die. Um, had this infection across our faces, which meant you'd take a mouthful of food and your lips would crack and bleed and you could just taste blood for the rest of the meal. We'd also have this, well, I in particular had this issue with my, my toes where I got this really, really bad fungal infection. And it meant that I had to lance my toes every two or three days just to depuss them and get to be able to fit them inside the boots. So oh. this, yeah, the back end of the trip wasn't pretty. And I've never pushed myself that hard on, on a journey. It just was, yeah, tear you apart. And were you in communication with a home base like you were with the kayaking trip? Yeah. So on a trip like that, we, we talked to our support team based in Sydney. We like what we've always worked out is you, you have one key point, uh, one key contact. And that's, a, that's a little handy hint, hint. Like don't try and manage a multitude of people. Just have one person who manages all those other people for you. So that logistical manager, but also down in Antarctica, we had to make one other phone call every day. And that was to the base down in Antarctica that we were, was responsible for us so they could keep, you know, updated of our position and make calls on how we were doing. And uh, so it was quite funny because of all our, I suppose our weight loss over the course of the trip, they, you know, it was Cass and Jonesy. I'm J- Justin Jones and Cass is James Castrician that were called Cass and Jonesy. They, they changed our moniker and nickname to skin and bonesy because we basically <laughs> lost so much, so much weight. 
But yeah. yeah. And I mean, so now you're you're stuck out in the Arctic, and uh, you are you have you're bleeding from your lips, you're passing blood, your your body's deteriorating, you're uh, releasing pus from your toes, and even at this point, you still did not just reach out to either contact and call the trip. What was it that? How did you know you were going to be capable enough to finish the trip? And if these things weren't a big enough red flag, like, hey, you know, I should take a break. Do you know what would have eventually been the breaking point for you where you had to call it? Would you, you had to have been in completely incapacitated? Yeah, look, I mean, the, these journeys, you're not going to let them go lightly. If you've worked for, you know, the Tasman three and a half years to lead up to a journey like this or Antarctica, you know, two, two and a half years of preparation and planning to lead up to that journey, you're not going to let it die quietly. You're not just going to go, you know what? I'm not feeling good today. I'll press the button. We'll get out of here because you've invested so much into it. You know, you've invested a huge amount of time. You've invested, you know, the pain and frustration of your friends, your family, you know, their commitment to the journey. You've raised a ton as well. Like these trips, they're not cheap. We raised, you know, three to $400,000 to do these expeditions each, you know, each one. And so when it comes to suffering on the trail, yeah, there were days, and I'll be honest, there were days where I was broken down in Antarctica and I wanted to curl up into a ball and just cry. And that was it, you know, and it was hard work for me to get back on the trail and and start skiing. But in reality, I chose to be there. So, I mean, what right did I have to complain about some, a path that I chose to do? Yeah, sure. At times things weren't going well, but I chose to put myself there. And one thing that we use, it was a bit of a, well, what I used in particular, it's a bit of a, a tool because we, it's the power perspective. So we had inside the tent, little notes written all over the inside of our tent. Some of them from friends, from family, you know, wishing us well and just writing, you know, motivational things for us. But in pride of place on either side of the tent were two two uh, notes from written by kids that were going through chemotherapy. We were using that journey to raise money and awareness for a, a youth cancer charity. And you'd be feeling so upset, so shitty at yourself and, you know, want to pack the trip in. And you turn and look at the tent on the side and see this note from a little kid who's going through that cancer battle. And they're going through that battle with so much more grace and decorum than you are at that moment. And they didn't choose to be there. What right did you have to actually complain when you chose to be put there? And so that was a really powerful thing for me to, to kind of go, oh, you know what? I've just got to pick myself back up. Just got to go back on the trail. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. And, <clears throat> and now you finally make it. And th- th- that had to be an incredible feeling to finally get back. And what was the first thing you did once you returned to uh, civilization? I've, I've got to talk about the end of the trip first though, sure. uh, if you don't mind. Um, the, the, there was a huge twist to that Antarctic expedition. And the twist was that we, when we turned up to the start line to do this journey, when we were in Punta Arenas in, in Chile, about to fly down to Antarctica, uh, another person emerged from the woodwork, a guy by the name of Alexander Gami who is a Norwegian polar guide. And he told us that he's going to do the exact same expedition as us. He was going to be the first person to ski from the edge of Antarctica to the South Pole and back. And, you know, we, what we did is we said, you know, it was, it was going to be the longest unsupported, unassisted polar expedition of all time. And so we're like, right, shit. Okay. We're in a race with this bloke. And so we started going out there with this mentality. We had to beat this guy across and, he, when we were coming into the South Pole, we found out that he was actually five days ahead of us. So we're like, all right, we're going to try and catch him, but he's ahead. And we realized when we got to the finish line that he'd beaten us. And so there was a bit of a bittersweet feeling to this whole journey. And I'll never forget skiing down the final slope towards our finish line, this imaginary line, which was the end of our journey. And there was this little rock on the horizon. And that's what we're going to aim for is we're skiing down this slope and we were skiing, we'd fall over, we'd pick ourselves back up, keep skiing, just always focus on this rock until finally, when we got down to the bottom of that slope and we looked up, we realized it was actually not a rock at all. It was a six foot three tall blonde Norwegian bloke who was waiting three kilometers short of that finish line. He was waiting two miles before the end of the journey so that we could finish this trip together. Wow. I mean, insane. Like he, 
he was under so much pressure from the authorities, from, you know, people to get out of there. And he was like, no, I'm waiting for these two blokes. You know, I'm going to wait for these guys because, because they went through this journey with me. And, you know, if there wasn't for them sort of pushing me along just by being down here in these situations, I never would have finished this journey. You know, the three of us, Cass, Alex, and myself, we all believe if only one team had gone down that year, it wouldn't have made it. So pretty phenomenal like that finish seeing him there and being able to sort of share that that end with him it's like it's gonna have such an in, indelible permanent mark in my mind about what sportsmanship and what kindness and what humility and what humanity actually is about and it's not about winning it's not it's about you know rather than you stand on the peak of a mountain all by yourself it's about how you can drag a group of people along with you how can you share those experiences how can you collaborate with people and so that is one of the big key things that I've taken from, from that expedition. It's forever changed my perspective on life. Wow, man, that, that is incredible. Did you have much communication with him before the trip started or was this really one of the first times you guys talked? The first time we found out about it, we found out about it was, was literally in South America. And so we were like, dumbfounded and like i'm gonna be honest i wanted to hate the guy i really did like he's just like this guy's coming along to steal our, you know and you know our glory and all this rah rah and he, so we were we were upset by it and he's a hard guy to hate though so over the course of the whole expedition you know we'd talk on the satellite phone maybe every two weeks and he was so open with information it's like, guys, if you're suffering from this problem on the trail, like what, what, what you're telling me, like this is what we do back in Norway. This is what I would do if I was you. You know, he was sharing information with his competitor. And so like that, I mean, <laughs> that's just such an amazing spirit. And like it, this, this friendship, this bond grew. And like we had a really bad season in terms of the weather down there. And like we both went through and we both weathered that. And he's the only other guy that I feel that connection with other than Cass. Um, so, you know, we've really made a friend for life there. I mean, I, I absolutely love the bloke full stop. Yeah. Without wow. a doubt. <clears throat> that, that's incredible. I, I mean, it would have been hard to compete with a guy who grew up in Norway growing up in yeah, uh, Bali. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, he's, 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 yeah. One, he can ski properly. Like, he's <laughs> quite <popular. laughs> right. Right. I, I did, I did a presentation in Norway a, a few years back and I'll never forget, you know, showing a video of us fi finishing this journey off skiing to the finish line. And some guy yells out in the crowd, oh, they still can't ski. And that's kind of the truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's the beauty of it all is that it doesn't matter that you can't ski. You still did it. Yeah. No, I mean, we can ski. It's just not going to be pretty, you know? <laughs> it's not a Norwegian <laughs> No, technique. the glide. Oh, man, it's beautiful. Yeah. Can I ask what is wrong with Cass to do these trips with you? Who's <laughs> Or is Ooh, it I you? don't know. Like it's, 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 I think it's both of us. I mean, there, there's some sort of strange thing. I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's hard to nail it down. Like if you find that person, and that's something about these journeys and trips, it's so powerful when you find a person that's willing to do the kind of same stuff as you. And I will admit that like Cass is probably the bloke that's probably come up with some of these harebrained ideas. And I'm the one that's stupid enough to say, you know what, that sounds like a good idea because it beats working for a living, you know? And so, um, it's so powerful when you do find another person though, because when you get those big hits, when you get sponsorships that fall through or just um, a kayak that flops over on its side in the water, without that supportive network, without another person going through it, it can cripple you. I know a lot of people that have tried to do trips and have failed in the lead up because they have had some severe hits that they haven't been able to recover from. When there's a team of you, it's a lot easier to share that pain amongst each other. So speaking of teams, your, your last trip, I believe, was a walk, a very long one, and yep. your team shifted slightly. Uh, can you explain this trip and who your, who your team actually was? Okay. So the idea for that trip was to try and walk through the outback of Australia, and we ended up walking from the center of Australia to the ocean, uh, a, a journey oh, of... Dude. <laughs> 1,800 kilometers, which is 1,125 miles. And my expedition partners were my wife, Lauren, who I absolutely love to, to bits, and our 15-month-old daughter, Morgan. <laughs> yeah. And we were, again, unsupported, so no vehicles with us or anything like that. We were just us out there unaccompanied on, on these sort of like dirt tracks through the outback. That, wow. so... <laughs> <laughs> all right so did you primarily follow the docker river 
just so no no so docker river is um was our start point it's a there's not much of a river there really to be to be honest but it's it's the name of a town docker river it's it's indigenous name is katkajara and we started from there and then we worked all the way down to a place called port augusta so a thousand eight hundred kilometers and um i talk about like if I was to rank the three, three major trips, I've done a lot of other ones, but the three major trips I've done, I'd say the Tasman highest risk of death, Antarctica highest risk of injury, the outback highest risk of divorce. Like, let's be honest. (laughs) And and it pushed our relationship to the, to the absolute brink. It really did. And ultimately, you know, for me on that trip, there could have been a result that was worse than death. You know, if we had irrevocably broken our relationship and, you know, it ended up in a divorce per se, then that would be an outcome worse than death. Like, really? Yeah. And well, I mean, do you mind explaining some of the things that cause strain in your relationship? <laughs> it would oh, Lauren be you. okay with it? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure she'll probably call in, you know, to you guys and then send, the, oh, wait, send hold an on. email. She's letter. calling in right now. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, look, there was... <sighs> Okay, we had a lot of typical, I suppose, you know, husband and wife fights that you'd have over over any course period of time. And like, it, it was more a reflection on the situation, what was going on, or the fact that our daughter was like teething out there on the trail. Like one, at one point she started teething. We're in a little tent with her. So there was a week straight where we didn't sleep. And like, we're both going crazy. And, and then you tend to snap at each other because it's more about the situation that causes the friction rather than the fact that you hate the other person. Obviously, since you're married to them, you're not going to hate them. Now, the biggest issue and the biggest probably fight we had was 100, and I'm going to say it was my fault. I have never gone on a journey with a loved one like Lauren that you can emotionally dump on. And you can be really, really vulnerable to and show the, the, the weakest, most vulnerable side of yourself. And I started taking liberties with that. I started just like, if I was feeling bad, I'd be unloading this onto her. And I wouldn't do that to, you know, Cass or another one of my expedition buddies who typically, you know, might be a male or a person that I don't know that well, because there's, a, there's an ego thing that comes into it. With my wife, I didn't have that ego filter. And I would just tell her and dump how I'd feel. I feel. And she was like, after the reason for this was I actually damaged my ankle in the, in the third week of the trip and had to deal with it for the next, you know, 11 weeks of the journey and like pretty badly. And so I was complaining about that to her each and every day. And some mornings I wouldn't be able to walk and I'd be kind of crawling around until finally, like I'd get enough mobility, get into a boot, strap it up and like just make it rigid enough to be able to walk. And she snapped at me and she's like, you wouldn't be, dumping this on me if I was another person. So why are you doing it? Why are you just emotionally unloading this on me? And she was like, this trip's over. You know, I'm done. I, I can't handle this. It's not good for us. It's not good for our relationship. And, and it's not good for your ankle. Like, I don't want a cripple for, you know, a husband. If this is doing you damage, permanent damage, I don't want to be here. And it was a real big wake up for me because I thought this trip had just crumbled in front of me and this was over. And I was like, you know what? She's right. I've got to pull back and realize that I can't just push my issues onto her just because I love her, you know, just because I feel comfortable doing that. And so I had to take a step back and I find out, you know, six months down the track that she was never serious about quitting. Cause like, she was like the next tomorrow I'm quitting, you know, unless you can prove to me, otherwise I'm quitting tomorrow. And so like I was on my best behavior for the next day and then the next week, and then it just extended out for the rest of the journey. Whereas in reality, she was just trying to get me to shut up, I think. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, she motivated you, right. To keep going too. Uh- yeah. Yeah, she was proper, proper, proper ticked off though. She really was. Yeah. Can I ask what's been harder, the self quarantining throughout COVID nineteen or the that expedition? I'm not gonna lie, it's self quarantining. Yeah, it's it really is. I mean, being stuck in a in like we live in a two bedroom apartment in in Bondi Beach in Sydney, and when you're locked away inside and you can't really go out and do anything. And you've got a toddler of four years old and a, a, a relatively newborn at five months old. Yeah. Yeah. That's, 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 that's tough. That's really tough. And like, I, I honestly think we wouldn't be going through this as well as we are if we hadn't gone through the app trip. Right. I think it'd be worse if we hadn't done that expedition. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and how did you take care of a 15 month old? I mean, it, 
you know, they, there are so many needs associated with a baby. Now, I guess that there's portions of the day where the, your, your, your child would be sleeping, mm. but uh, there, there's still a lot of elements to handle, to, to deal with in Australia, right? It gets incredibly hot in the outback. Did yeah. you, how did you, how did you take those safety precautions? So the temperature variation we had over the course of that journey was, you know, the hottest day we had was 43 degrees uh, Celsius, which is 108, 109 Fahrenheit down to the coldest was minus two degrees Celsius, which would be minus 28. Uh, sorry, not minus, just 28 degrees, sorry, Fahrenheit. And so you get a big variation temperature. The heat was harder to deal with than, than the cold, obviously, because like we'd have certain nights where it wouldn't drop below, you know, 85, um, like horrible, horrible. And so, you know, I, there were all those elements to have to deal with the dehydration, you know, trying to keep it safe from things like snakes, from spiders and all that sort of stuff. But she actually did better than my wife and I, like, honestly, she did. And like too many people and like so many people look when they hear about this journey, are like, Oh geez, you know, you know, how'd you keep her safe? You know, that's really abnormal. You shouldn't be doing that with a child in reality with her with Morgan. She didn't realize that it was an abnormal thing to do. So right. it just became, it became her normal. So every day she just, as long as she's with mom and dad, she didn't care what she was doing. She was safe. And, and I don't know any other one of my mates who's had that time with both parents with a kid like that at that age, 24 seven for that period of time for four months straight, we were together as a family and it was amazing. We're like, we really bonded as a family unit and I probably learned the biggest lesson I've learned from adventure and that came from Morgan. So the outback of Australia, if you've ever, have you ever been, you guys? No, no. Yeah. So gnarly place. It's amazingly stunning, but it's also a pretty harsh environment. And there's and one thing in particular is the thorns. So there's like, you get these massive thorns actually out there. I had 11 flat tires over the course of the journey and the, my cart that I was dragging along behind me, which weighed up to 270 kilos. So what that's like 550 Ooh. pounds or something like that. Yeah. And, and so Morgan's learning to walk in the outback. She's just started walking two weeks before our trip. And so she's stepping on these thorns. They're going straight into her feet. She's falling oh. over and landing. And they're going to the palms of her hands. And the first three, four weeks, she's crying. She's screaming. And I'm just like, what have I done? You know, I'm going to damage my child. You know, she's going to come back mentally scarred. And in reality, she was crying at the start of it. And then the cries slowly got less and less and less until finally she just step on a massive thorn. It'd go into her feet. She just, without, without crying, she'd lift her foot up and go, Ooh, prick. You'd flick it out and she'd keep running. Like it became normal for her to, to, to deal with that environment. And I think as adults, we forget that we, we, stick up you know we have to think about the status quo keeping up with the joneses you know get all the mod cons keep things keeping safe up with the joneses exactly that that's a different mob that one um <laughs> and so in reality i think as adults we should just you know challenge what the, the the preconceived notion of what normal is you know take that pathless travel go on that adventure go on that trip whether it's you know across the outback or wherever it is it's you know go on that pathless trodden right yeah i i have a 20 month old and how's it going I, it's it's going well. It's going great. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. It's a ton of fun. I now we I don't have any experience um, traveling with her yet though. We 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 have a trip planned for September for Italy. Uh, you know, fingers crossed. But um, they they are adaptable human beings. So is and they're very willing willing to follow your lead. You know, if they see you do it, they assume that it can be done really no questions asked to a degree. If, if that makes sense, they're, oh, they're very willing, right. To just to go along with it. I mean, they, they, they see you, you're their leader, you're their father, you're their parent, whatever it may be. And they trust you and they're willing to learn uh, without any sort of preconceived fears um, or just lack of motivation. They just say, okay, this is what we do. Let's do it. That they have no definition of what the possible, what is possible and what's impossible. So like, that's something you learn. And I've noticed it now in my toddler, she's four years old. She's got this, and it's probably taught by me of an idea of the things you can't, can and can't do. Um, and I'm, I'm always trying to challenge that with her now, even though I know I think I've set those limits on her by telling her she shouldn't do certain things. But when you're that, they're that young, you're just like, yeah, this is fine. This is cool. You know, it's, this must be normal. You know, I'm, I'm sitting around playing around the dirt, you know, like she was like covered in sand 
and we should have flies swarm her face, you know, and just be like letting her, you know, sitting underneath her eyes, trying to drink the fluid from her eyeballs, you know, like, and wow. like it's just normal. It's just flies, you know, it looks abnormal. I should send you some photos, but yeah, you should. please do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God, yeah, that's incredible, man. Do you have anything else planned for the future? Are you eyeing up a new, a new trip at any point? Yeah, look, I think I, we can't exactly. So our first daughter, Morgan, you know, we took on this big, massive odyssey through the outback. And then our second daughter, Dylan, like you can't exactly just take it to the local theme park or the water slide, you know, it just doesn't work. So it'd be unfair if we didn't do a trip with her, I think. So I, I think so. Yeah. yeah so, I agree. so, so when we come out of this whole COVID thing, I think we're going to look at doing a very long cycle trip. I think that's the plan. Uh, and I think COVID's actually propelling us down that path a bit because the walls suddenly feel so much more close together, right. you know, when, you, when you're trapped inside them. And so when that gets released, I think we'll be going on a, on a journey. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So we have a new segment that we'll get into, but before we get into that, can you share some of your website, social media, uh, basically places of contact that people could reach out to you? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So uh, social handles, my personal social handle is at Justin R. Jonesy. So that's J-U-S-T-I-N-R j-o-n-e-s-y um if you're keen to find out more about that sort of outback expedition my, my wife curates that sort of kind of family one which is at follow the jonesies and our website's pretty simple www.justinjonesy.com and i have just launching a new one uh along with my wife it's called adventurethinking.com and adventure thinking is going to be sort of like i'm going to be doing a series of pretty gnarly little interviews and fireside kind of chats with some, some interesting people actually out there that have done some pretty extreme things and trying to delve into that mindset. And uh, it's going to be a bit different because it's going to be involving sort of like a, a keynote portion where they're going to be actually doing a bit of a presentation, a bit of a, a riff on a certain theme. That's something that they think is going to help people, especially in this time of um, COVID-19. That sounds incredible. I can't wait to, to yeah. yeah. What did you say that myself? myself? Uh, adventurethinking.com adventure we're launching next week awesome very awesome all right so this new segment is called rapid fire questions and what we do is bob and i alternate through 20 questions and oh, you no. need to respond with whatever is on the top of your head oh god oh no <laughs> no <laughs> pressure do you like want to get going first or do you I'm want to try- <laughs> i'm just trying to think about like until i put them put the filter in my brain in or not what's going to come out of my mouth no filter no filter. Okay, no filter no filter, no okay. filter. <laughs> all right bob you start okay uh what is the first word that comes to your mind when you think of the word travel adventure uh, straight away what home comfort do you miss the most while traveling a proper pillow do you prefer travel to travel solo or with a partner a partner if you could swim in any liquid, what would it be? I don't know why I thought this is lava. <laughs> <laughs> All right, pick two hey, animals. If you could swim in lava, that is a phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal ability. <laughs> if you could pick any two animals to see fight, which two animals would they be? Uh, a spatchcock and a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Which country has the friendliest people? I was going to say a country that I've never been to. So that, that's, that's wrong. And the first thing that jumped <laughs> in my mind was just the country was like Libya. And I'm like, I've never been to Libya. Um, Kiwis, New Zealand. Okay. All right. All right. Would you rather drink wine or coffee for the rest of your life? I cannot pick that right now. Like, honestly, you can't do that. We're in, we're locked in a house under COVID. <laughs> I need both of those things to survive right now. Um, Only coffee. one. Coffee. 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 Okay. coffee. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Can you say hello in your favorite language? Uh, I'm trying to, th- this is the reason why I paused is because like, there is actually no word for hello in Indonesian. Really? How do you greet? How do you greet? It's, it's, a, it's a greeting. It's generally a time, a time of day greeting. It's, you can say hi, obviously, but I mean, like, it's more like, you know, Salamat Pagi, which means good morning or Salamat Siang, which means good afternoon or Salamat, Salamat Sore, which means good afternoon, you know, good, good evening or afternoon, uh-huh. um, or Salamat Malam, which means good night. So yeah, that's yeah. okay. Yeah, All right. Okay. We'll go with yeah, that. Right Would you rather be stuck on a cruise ship or stuck in the Amazon jungle? Amazon jungle. Yeah. 
If you could travel with anyone in the world, living or dead, who would it be? Oh, my mate Alex Gammy. There we go. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Which do you prefer, the beach or the mountains? Oh, beach at the moment. All right. Oh, when conflicted. You are in Bondi. Conflicted. <laughs> who would win in a fight, a wombat or a sloth? Wombat, for sure. Yeah. I think we might have to alter this. It's, I think that's a pretty easy one, Bob. Yeah. Okay. I'm not too familiar with wombats or sloths, but this is the second Australian that said hands down wombat. So can I throw something back at you? Yeah. yeah. Who, who, uh, this is a question for you guys. Actually. Yeah. Here we go. I'm going to flip it on its head. Oh, oh no. <laughs> uh, who would win in a race? Usain Bolt or a wombat? I, I mean, I feel like this is a trick question. I, yeah. I want to go with Bolt, but is it a wombat? It's a wombat. A wombat can actually run faster than Usain Bolt. That's what? They're in, yeah. They're short little stumpy legs. They can run faster. You know, for a sustained like 200, 300 meters, they could beat Usain Bolt. If it was running full pace, it could beat Usain Bolt. Insane. See, uh, when I wrote this, I obviously had very little wombat knowledge. And <laughs> the more I learn about them, <laughs> the, the, yeah, okay. So I'm going to have to change that a one wombat, up. A wombat to me is as familiar as a womp rat from Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> oh right yeah, yeah. um that's that's the scene what does luke say and it's like oh i used to shoot them from like no yeah no so. yeah. yeah it's yeah, from the what do you hope all right next question <laughs> next uh pick one is uh, spaghetti or, and meatballs or pad thai pad thai what is one item remaining on your bucket list <sighs> north pole okay all right uh who was your biggest celebrity crush I mean, the first person that came to mind is Roald Armisen, but he's, he's one, he's dead. And I wouldn't say, oh, he's a celebrity. Yeah, Roald Armisen. Let's go with that. All right. Why not? Uh, window or aisle seat? Aisle. Which is your, what is your favorite travel item? My water bottle. All right. All right. If you were stuck in one city for the rest of your life, which city would you choose? Okay. This is the first city that popped into mind and I, I immediately regret it. Berlin. <laughs> Berlin. Why, why know, do you I, regret it? I, oh, I just like, cause I, I don't have any good memories of Berlin. Like it just popped into my head. It's the first, <laughs> oh, it's first, one of those, like not this yeah. city. Oh shoot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm sure it's great, but I mean, Hey, if you, if you owned a yacht, what would you name it? <laughs> <laughs> This is terrible. The first thing that popped in my head was the poop deck. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> that's, good. that's a great, like great guy name. <laughs> All right. And who is your favorite Traveler's Blueprint podcast host? Uh, I, I, I'm not, I can't. I'm sorry. This, 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 this is rude. Okay. What I'm doing <laughs> the whole is point I, of that question is to see how our guest handles awkwardness and uncomfortability. <laughs> Well, I, I guess I guess I want to please both of you. So what I'm going to do is if you guys could do a scissor, paper, rock against each other, and that's okay. going to define who, who my winner is. All right. All right. Just round, round, one round, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, one round. Paper, scissors, shoot. Oh, you both did scissors. <laughs> All right. Well, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh, there we go. Ah, gotcha. There we go. All right. Thank it's, you. It's Bob. Bob's my favorite. It's always been my favorite. I didn't want to tell you, Elliot. I'm so glad you won, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. That was awesome. All right, man. Um, do, you have, do you have anything else to add? Uh, if, if I guess, I mean, I, I, I'm excited to see, uh, you know, what the future holds for you and to check out your new, your new platform. Um, it's been awesome yeah. having you on today. Oh man, like super stoked to be part of the show. Like seriously, seriously, thank you so much for getting me on, getting me on board. I mean, I, I'm just excited for, uh, I don't know, the next couple of years, I think it's going to be very interesting for the Jones family. So on the cards is it has shifted the US for a while. I think there's going to be a big cycle trip, also a big sailing trip. My wife kind of made a deal with me. She was like, all right, well, if we're doing the outback journey, you got to make a you got to make a deal with me. And I'm like, Oh geez, she's got me bent over a barrel. She's like, I want something for myself. And I was like, she could take anything she wants. And she's like, look, this trip's more for you than it is for me. So I want to live in Italy for a year. And I was like, done, we can do that. And then she's like, but I want to sail back. So to Australia. So I think at some point in our lives, we're going to sail from, from the Mediterranean back to Australia. And that's going to be pretty, pretty gnarly. And I think so. Awesome. so. Yeah. 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 So, do you know how to sail? Know. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't matter, man. You can right. learn that. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Should be right. It's just simple physics, really. 
Hey, yeah, it always is, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect. All right, man. Thank you so much for coming on today. Bob Elliott, thank you so much. It has been a blast. And no hard feelings. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. no hard feelings. I, it's okay that you like Bob better. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, like this. It's just I don't know what it is. It's his musk, his scent, something there about it. Go. It's, just, it's yeah, definitely yeah. his smell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. There we yeah, go. Because that wafts across yeah. the pond all the way to. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Ellie, Ellie yeah. you just smell too clean. That's that's the problem. Yeah. There you yeah, go. That probably yeah. is the issue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Justin. Thank you again. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>